Welcome to the Bourbon Friday Show. We're doing something special tonight. We are here at Venture Cafe Art of Alcohol. And we're talking about the business of booze in a lot of ways. And right now I'm going to talk to Carla with 39 North. So Carla, thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, yeah. So tell me a little bit of what is 39 North first of all. So 39 North is a 600 acre innovation district that's okay. surrounded by the Danforth Plant Science Center anchored by Bridge Park, the Helix Biotech Incubator, Yield Lab, and of course, Bear Crop Science here Very in Creve cool. Corps, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So I know that, you know, plant sciences has become kind of a, it's all, I guess it's been a, a booming industry in St. Louis for quite a while now. So how long has 39 North been established for? So 39 North, we uh, got a grant in 2015 from the Department of Commerce to okay. do a master plan, which we oh, did cool. with a lot of input from uh, stakeholders and uh, launched the plan in 2016 and right now we have over six million dollars in infrastructure projects that are going on wow. plus money for programming for things like venture cafe which we brought awesome. on immediately to breathe life into this district very cool so talk to us about the idea of an innovation district right so kind of what what's the point of defining a particular area as is defined that way sure sure so an innovation district has several components in order okay. dr. Danforth and I work for the Danforth plant science center when he established the center he knew there were things that needed to be uh, come together to help science get to the consumer and okay. get to the commercial marketplace and that includes talent capital infrastructure like greenhouses you see out our back yeah. uh, window tonight and networking so we have gotcha. tried within 39 north to bring those things together and we've had a lot of success now in 39 north there's about over 50 startup companies really wow. as well as several international companies that come here because they want to make a soft landing and have their research headquarters uh, in the united states interesting so you mentioned kind of two sides of the coin there, obviously, with the startups versus established companies. So are you guys set up to attract both or is one of them a more of a focus for you? No, absolutely. We want to we want to empower homegrown companies. Part okay. of Venture Cafe is helping them uh, learn about things they need. How do they attract capital? How do they write a business plan? How do they do branding? How okay. do they go on video uh, intelligently and get their message across? Sure. And we want to be a beacon for international companies that need, that are looking to the United States to set up a place for their research headquarters or their soft landing. And at Ag Tech, here in St. Louis, we put that stake in the ground. We are the epicenter for Ag Tech. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. So obviously, St. Louis makes sense. You know, we're in the middle, of kind of where a lot of things are grown in the country, right? So, yes. uh, is this is St. Louis known as kind of the hub for a lot of this stuff, or is that something that, as an innovation district, you're trying to, to grow that that, fast, that facet of it? Sure. Well, the answer is yes and yes. Yes, both. We, of yes. course, keep it going, right? We, we are known for it because we have the world's largest seed company. Yeah. We have within a 500 mile radius of St. Louis, 50 percent of U.S. Uh, agriculture is produced. Wow, so we have yeah. the producers here, and we also have more than 1,000 plant science PhDs in the region, really? which Holy we cow. believe is more than anywhere else in the world. Now, is that a result of the universities that we have close to here, or is that because we've, we've attracted those people to this place? It is a result of the universities. We're, we're part of land. Uh, we have a land-grant university in Mizzou and the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Sure. We have the Danforth Plant Science Center with more than 300 employees. We have 250 people at the research park, another 88 at the Helix Center. Wow. Lord knows how many across the street sure, at Bear Crop Science. So. Um, it, it is a result of the growing of it, but we did have a very good foundation in um, the universities. Of course, yeah. Well, it's great. So it sounds like just a few years in, it's going really well. Uh, what can we expect from the future? What are we, what are we looking at in the next five to 10 years? Or so? Sure, sure. So part of 39 North is creating a innovation district that has the, the um, amenities that okay. we can attract that talent that's so important. So we are um, doing a lot of things to make it more walkable, more bikeable, with a greenway system that will connect to the Centennial Greenway that's part of the Great oh, cool. Rivers Greenway. Yeah. We have a huge project on that. We're redoing the Olive and Lindbergh Interchange to make that safer okay. to go across. The old Olive Street Road just to the west of us here uh, will be more like a Main Street feel. We're working oh, really? with the city of Creepore very closely to attract the types of businesses that young innovators want to have. Brew okay. pubs, distilleries, right, yeah. dry cleaners, um, 
restaurants where they can meet and connect and share ideas. Interesting. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that much about infrastructure change. It sounds like it's a big part of it. The yeah. Yeah. Theater right now. Okay. Uh, well, we're, uh, we're getting an announcement here, so I'm not sure how well you can hear us on the other end. But uh, we'll use this as our opportunity to transition a little. And uh, Eric, why don't, why, when he's done, why don't you tell us about the bourbon we're drinking here? The business of doing it. We'll sample it while uh, while we're waiting, right? Okay. Cheers. 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 All right, Eric, you're up. All right. After I've taken a, a sip, let's see. So what we have here is Wood Hat Brew Barrel. And I... A lot of times, we definitely try and um, match the bourbon to the event or, or whatever. So I tried to find a bottle that I could do for almost anybody here, at least based upon the program. Sure. So the first thing, because this is 39 North, well, Woodhead is made in New Florence, Missouri, which is at 39 and 6 minutes. So he's oh, wow. literally right there on 39 North. The other thing, this is the Art of Alcohol event. Well, I mean, Gary... From Wood Hat, it's grain to glass, you know, it's everything is heirloom grains. He also, you know, weathers the wood for his barrels on prop on property. So it's really art as much as it is the craft of making the alcohol. Of course, yeah. We're always happy to have a little bit of wood hat on the show. Exactly. Very cool. Eric, thank you, obviously, for bringing the bourbon on. As always, Carla, thanks for stopping by. Thank you so much. It was a good time talking to you. I appreciate it. And for those of you tuning in, you know, we're going to be back off and on throughout the night to talk to more people about the art of alcohol here at Venture Cafe. So please join us again in just a few moments. Thanks for tuning in. All right, well, we are back here with Bourbon Friday at the Art of Alcohol with Venture Cafe. I'm your host, Nick Niehaus, and I am talking to Dave from Still 630, who's here for his second time with us. So, Dave, thanks for joining us again, man. It's it's really an honor to be part of this oh, prestigious sure two-timers sure club. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, uh, we'll get your excited. jacket at the end Thank of the you. show. You know, <laughs> Thank but, uh, you. All right, well, I want to talk to you about a few things. I want to actually start by just having you tell us about what we're drinking, because this is a pretty interesting <laughs> creation you got here. Absolutely. So this is our Moonwalker whiskey. This is one of our brewery collaboration series. And that's based on the idea that whiskey's kind of just distilled beer in a sense. We call it distiller's beer. Okay. We don't carbonate it, we don't add hops, we don't louder it. But I was thinking like, what would happen if you took an awesome local beer, distilled that, <laughs> aged it in a new barrel. We're not reusing a barrel here, it's a new barrel. Okay. We're trying to get all the flavors of these unique beers into a whiskey. And they're intentional one-offs. We put them out a couple times a year our goal with this series the brewery collab series is to make something unusual unique hopefully delicious but something definitely different Definitely. if it okay. tastes like a normal whiskey it's not right for the series in my mind and cool. and this one in particular as i said is the moonwalker okay we use logboat brewing company out of columbia we use their dark matter beer which is a wheat porter okay. so it's got those big roasty notes in there somebody earlier was describing it as like burnt chocolate chip cookies as a whiskey Okay. So I don't know if that's really an appealing. Well, we'll find out. I'm going to try yeah. it and see what I, if I agree with that or not. Cheers. So cheers. Yeah. Oh, wow. Interesting. Different, right? Yeah, I'm getting I, right now. I, I, could, I could see the burnt chocolate chip cookie that. thing. I yeah, can see that even a, off the nose. Real roasty bit. notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, not a bad, it's not a bad description. So tell me, tell me about this process, right? Because I mean, obviously, I think we talked on the first uh, episode about yeah. how, you know, we start with beer in most cases when you make whiskey, right? But yeah. I guess one of my questions is, does it matter what kind of beer? Can you turn any beer into a whiskey? Or are there certain kinds that are they're better than others? Well, so from everything I've read and understand, you want to stay away from a lot of your IPAs, your big hoppy okay. beers, because the alpha acids in the hops will degrade and eat away the copper of your still. Oh, really? Okay. So you could do it, but for like a limited amount of time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, so that, that does limit us a little bit in the styles. We're working on some workarounds to maybe add those back a little bit later because we don't want to carve out a lot of those delicious beers. But theoretically, you could take any anything that has alcohol. You could use kombucha if you had enough of it. Yeah. Distill that down, and by aging it in an oak barrel, you turn it into a whiskey as long as it's a grain base to begin with. Right um, so maybe that would rule out kombucha. I don't know. I uh, yeah. no. sure. definitely didn't know about this until I actually went on your tour yeah. and you told me, because I think it was last year's release or whatever, I, I was just like, wait, you can do that? All right. And Good what, to know. Exactly. I, I have not done this, 
but <laughs> theoretically it's possible it is possible and what we try to do is pick really unique interesting beers that, that we personally love course, you know yeah. um so we're looking about what would make a good whiskey what would make a different style of spirit right yeah. we've done uh we did a pumpkin ale from o'fallon brewing company that's our headless horseman whiskey uh we did a peanut butter chocolate milk stout from four hands sure uh, yeah. was, that was a wild one and we've done modern and urban chestnut alpha and a whole bunch of that's different cool. people I think we might have had the peanut butter one. I don't know. Possibly. It sounds familiar. Presence of Darkness. Yeah, that, that, well, that, sound, that sounds and That familiar. one was a real cult hit. Like we, That was the biggest yeah. batch of... Well, I was going to ask you about that because you mentioned one-offs, right? So yeah. have you had one yet that people are like, you got to bring this back, you got to do it again? Or? So we did, uh, with Modern Brewery, we did Still Modern. We took a beer to guard they made, to, you know, a Belgian uh, keeping ale, like okay. French-style keeping ale. Really nice floral notes. That was the second one we ever released. It was a hit. We did it again. Turned out to be our fourth release, but we put a finish on it. We finished it in the same barrel that they used to age one of their chocolate coffee stouts. Sure. So okay. Made it different. The Presence of Darkness, Four Hands, uh -huh. Peanut Butter Chocolate Milk Stout, that one was a huge cult hit. People were loving it. They've been bugging me ever since. So last year we bought about 2,000 more gallons of beer from them. Oh, wow. Distilled it. That'll come out at 6.30 day, 2020. Okay. So June 27th <laughs> is what you want to mark your calendars for. All right. That Saturday, Presence of Darkness Batch 2 comes out. Okay, so is that going to be the first time you, you bring one back? Yeah. Sounds like officially? Yeah, cool. that'll be the first one we do the same thing. Very cool. And we, well, that's awesome. We definitely increase the batch size, so there'll be yeah. many more than 750 so bottles. There's a lot of demand, yeah. so you got to got to satisfy the demand, of course. We're trying. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Well, i got some other questions for you. Um, I want to talk to you about the Distillers Guild, right, which you're now the president of, I understand. So, Grand you know, the Grand Poo by congratulations Thank on you. your election or selection. <laughs> I don't know how the process is. from the people. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of terms you can throw in there. Hostile takeover. It's not oh, okay. one that I really embrace. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, but, that's how it worked out. But you know, yeah, you know. Tomato, tomato. Yeah. Uh, no, we got elected in there, and I am the second president of the guild, and it's been a great honor in trying to bring all the distillers together from Missouri to really do some awesome right, stuff. We launched. We uh, at six thirty in the Lane of Brick Theater on the first floor. Oh, okay. Well. We should probably get done soon so you can get to whatever you're supposed to go to next. <laughs> but we launched our state distillery trip, the Missouri Spirits Expedition, all across the state, 29 different distilleries. That's one of the things I'm most proud of for this year. But it's really kind of advocating and promoting all the great distilleries that are all around this brew lab. We're just, just happen to be one of them. Yeah. The well, there's quite a few now, right? I mean, it's kind of, is it, is it continuing to grow? Are more distillers you know, still opening up? Or what there, there are many in the works. We have 35 members, 29 of which are on the trail. Some are members, they're just not open yet, or their, their tasting rooms aren't open. So I expect to see 10 to 15 over the next few years wow, that will come onto the scene. And the best part about Missouri is, You've got really talented people making every different kind of spirit. Sure. We passed a law to make Missouri bourbon whiskey an exactly. official thing. Nice. But a lot of us don't make bourbon. You sure. know? We've got brandies, we've got vodkas, gins, rums, eau de vies. Uh, there's agave spirits being made. Everything basically you can think of. Yeah. Somebody in Missouri is doing it really well. Right. That's awesome. And I appreciate the fact that that all exists on that one website to where I can actually go and see what is actually out there. What website are you talking about? Your guild website. Would I don't remember. Would that be the Missouri the... Craft .com? It might be. <laughs> yeah. That's a good website. It's <laughs> a good one. Yeah. Do you want to repeat that again just to make sure everybody got it? www. <laughs> dot Missouri Craft Distillers Guild dot com. There you go. Nice plug. I like that. Yeah, there you go. So I, I want to, you know, it's on uh, the World Wide Web. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're obviously at a point. You know, I, I was looking this up today that you know beer is actually shrinking as a part of the market, right? And uh, spirits has really been growing, and a lot of it's attributed. I was I was reading some of this. It's attributed to the cocktail scene that like millennials Millennial are racing now. Right? Yeah. Me is attributed just to you. <laughs> you are You're the welcome. sole driver. <laughs> that is a huge. They're You're like hey, when he took over as president, yeah. took off. I don't know where it was, but <laughs> here we go. The stocks were rising. Right. What I was saying was that the sorry, the craft is the craft cocktails, the mixologists. Yeah are a huge thing, but it's also the consumers, it's a multifaceted reason right there. It's, it's following beer, and everybody that got into craft beer was doing it in search of new flavors, new styles. Yes. And that just naturally translates into spirits. Yeah. And the culinary, the food, and the pairings, 
all the great chefs. I mean, St. Louis is nationwide recognized for having incredible sure. cuisine. Oh, yeah. When you have a great meal, you need great cocktails, you need great spirits, and wine and beer to all go with and make it sure. a great experience. So, you say millennials, but the younger folks that are looking to drink new things, they're looking to expect, and people want authenticity. That's why I think the Guild works so well, because it's a collection of individual stories of American entrepreneurs that are trying to make great quality spirits right here in Missouri. And so people love connecting with that. And again, Matt's intentionally bring it back to the expedition. Go on the trail and meet those yeah. people, and you can see the story behind it. We're not monolithic companies that are industrially producing right. tens of thousands of gallons a day. Yeah. That's none of us. Of course, yeah. We're all doing it by hand, painstakingly with love for a reason, for a story behind it. And people really are buying into that these days, not to mention all those great bartenders out there that are whipping up incredible cocktails with ingredients yeah. I've never heard of. They're incredible, you know? That's great. And they just happen to use awesome local spirits. Right. And I mean, we had the last hotel on the show, you know. Those guys are great. Right. And, and, they, and, and you know, they said that okay. your gin that's there was outperforming vodka on the bar. Wow. And, really? and I will say, like, the last rye that Port finished, that went pretty, they gave us a bottle. That went pretty fast at Bourbon Friday. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. They've been out for a little while. We've yeah. got another batch coming, but it takes a while because we that's our rye whiskey that we finish yeah. in a special Napa Valley port wine barrel. Yeah. And it just takes a certain amount of time mm -hmm. to get that right balance of the finishing of the port with the rye. And it sinks that we can't just churn it out as fast as we do the gin. Sure. Um, but they came to us and their owners and their, their management team over there, they came and they had a specific idea in mind for that gin, two-step mm -hmm. gin. And so we built it and it's it's so unique and it's been a big hit for us too. But it's only available, we make it exclusively for the last yeah. hotel and you can get a little bit in our tasting room. But it's, that's been a killer partnership and just working with them has been awesome. And I yeah. love what they brought to St. Louis. It's really, really an iconic place. And once that weather heats up again, you can find me on the oh, rooftop. Yeah, the rooftop, man. I still haven't made it over, but I need to. Oh, it's, it's amazing. It the views, the views are great even yeah. in the cold weather. Really? Yeah, yeah. worth checking out. Well, Definitely. we're almost out of time today, but I do want to ask you about, are you still doing your uh, first Fridays? Yes. Yeah, so tell us about that, because, I mean, you talk about doing a lot of experimentation in this, and yeah. this, this is a really cool thing for those that yeah. might want to come check it out. Yeah. So on the first Friday of every month, in the distillery, we release a brand new experimental spirit. We're doing one per month for five years. Next month in December, we will be exactly halfway through this program. So number okay. 30 comes out. We theme up the quarters, but you can come out 5 to 10 o'clock. We have incredible cocktails. Okay. We make them from scratch and switch up the menu every month. They're really dynamite. At 6.30 p.m., the free part happens. Everybody gets a little sample. We tell you what was in the glass, what we were going for, then enjoy. You know, we have a little survey. We're literally asking everybody to come out and tell us good, bad, and different. Wow. What do you think about this? everybody loves it we'll make it yeah cool how, how many of them have so far gotten to that stage so x4 was our apple brandy we've scaled up okay. x10 was our spiced rum which we're in the process of scaling up okay. and hope to have that early second quarter 2020 All that's right. our target right now um, and we're working we've been narrowing down because we're looking on a year-round bourbon recipe and some smoked whiskeys not to mention barrel aged gins yep. which we're hoping to scale up and have late first quarter 2020 so really? okay. we'll see but that's our timeline so a lot of them we've we've actually accidentally had some really knockouts in there some of them were designed to take a little bit longer to go okay out of these three you like these two more so let's hone down on that path if we have this sort of a nuance some of this roastiness dial it up dial it back what do people think about that i mean we've got to age it so in December, we're also doing a third Friday. So December 6th really? is the first Friday. Okay. December 20th will be the third Friday. 5 to 10 o'clock, whole world's welcome. You don't need to RSVP, you just need to bring your friends and show up. All right, just show up. At Easy the distillery, enough. which happens to be located conveniently. There you go. Downtown St. Louis, <laughs> corner of 4th and Shota, 1000 South 4th Street. Perfect. And if you come to Bourbon Friday, you come hang out with us. And I guarantee you can make it there for Tell the poor me. because I have. Yeah. Say, and I have a lot more work done. to do. <laughs> so come to Bourbon Fridays and then bandwagon on over. Right. Still six, First and third Fridays in December. I love yeah, it. That's right. 
and I appreciate that I don't have to tee you up for the plugs. It's good. No. You know, it makes my job much easier. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, it. Wind me up and there you go, Dan. Yeah, I don't even need to be here. I just sit you down in the chair and let you go, right? We need you guys for the visit. Yeah, you know, I know. We, right. we balance it out a little bit. Yes, right, right. thank you. All right, well, I think we're running out of time, but I want to thank you both for joining me. Eric, as always, thanks for being here. And Dave, thanks for stopping by again, second thank time. Thank you for having me. We'll get your jacket after the show's after over. That. Yeah, you know, we'll mount it on the wall and I'll, I'll sit the whole for my bust. Thing. Of course, yeah, we get to sit for like two days. Are you, yeah. you ready for that? I don't know. It takes a <laughs> All right. Well, those of you tuning in, we want to thank you for joining us again. We are going to be here for another hour or so here at the Art of Alcohol with Venture Cafe. Thanks for watching us and join us again in just a few minutes. All right. Well, we are back here at the Art of Alcohol with Venture Cafe. This is the Bourbon Friday Show, and I'm your host, Nick Niehaus. And I'm talking to Mark Perkins, who's the city administrator of Free Forum. So, Mark, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about 39 North, which mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about earlier on the show, um, which is based here in Creve Corps, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, talk, talk to me about, like, you know, how did that partnership and that situation even come to be? Yeah. Well, um, so, really, Creve Corps has been fortunate for decades to be a host of, of a lot of, you know, ag tech, biotech industry. Sure. Certainly with Monsanto prior to, um, prior to being bought out by Bayer. But the Dan Forest Center has really been a, a linchpin for the ag tech industry, really not only in, in Creve Corps, but certainly across St. Louis and Missouri. Of course, yeah. So um, when, when the Dan Forest Center was created about 20 years, which is a, as you know, was really um, kind of a product of, of, of a whole lot of um, effort by, by educational institutions, Bayer's, Bayer and others, uh, Monsanto at the time. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think they always had a vision for creating something larger than just the Danforth Center. Sure, okay. So, um, really more recently, St. Louis Economic Development Council has gotten very active in trying and in, in understanding, hey, what an asset this is and, and how, what the potential is in the region. So, um, we've been excited to be working with St. Louis Economic Development Partnership um, and Danforth and the other partners to do what we can do in a supporting role sure. in the city of Freeport mm -hmm. to help um, grow this industry. So our focus has been really on planning okay. um, with the St. Louis uh, Economic Development Partnership sure. uh, and St. Louis County, by the mm -hmm. way. Uh, it's been in land use planning. It's also been an in infrastructure planning. Sure, yeah. So uh, as a result of that, we do have several projects that are uh, off the ground right now and, and kind of getting, getting some momentum um, and so, yeah, we're excited about what this means for, for Creve Corps, certainly, but mm -hmm. understanding really this is really, really a regional win yeah, for St. Louis. Yeah. Well, it sounds like Creve Corps has been focused on this this industry for quite a while, right? Mm -hmm. With Monsanto and then Bayer being here. Yes. Um, so when 39 North, you know, was coming to be, it was kind of an idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what did, what did you do to facilitate that? I mean, how, how do you attract a, a project of that size and scope uh, to an area like Creve Corps? You know what? It really is a lot about collaboration. Okay. And really that collaboration has to be, has to come from, from really the private sector as well as the public sector. Sure, yeah. And, uh, and having Danforth, you know, really taking a, a real strong leadership role in, in wanting to see this grow and, and see St. Louis become really a, um, a really a world class leader in ag tech. Yeah, that has a lot to do with it, um, and certainly having willing uh, you know partners in, on the public side, which Creve Corps has been for a long time. Sure. Um, and St. Louis County, St. Louis Economic Development Partnership, and the state of Missouri as well. So it really takes a real collaborative attitude on on an approach on all those partners to make something like this come about and of course there's a long way to go sure. but yeah. it's all about recognizing hey this is a long-term process you look at what cortex has accomplished sure. Down, sure. Yeah. Uh, in st louis city and, and and how amazing that is and i think if you went down there 10 years ago you would say oh yeah you like know, nothing like it does where, now where yeah. is it you know sure. where is it now and, and it's kind of like I think where we're at right now, you know, we, we've got oh, a ways really? to go. So you, do you expect it to develop to that extent? I, mean, I, I think it, it certainly has all that potential. Yeah, um, right. Not necessarily with the same focus, a little bit different focus sure, with AgTech sure, right. here, um, but it, 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 it certainly is something that's going to take some vision, and I, and I think with 
with all the, the, the focus and energy that we have on it right now, I think we have a, a good opportunity to, to make that happen. That's great. Well, it certainly sounds like there's some momentum you know, that's mm -hmm. already been building. So what are some of the projects we can expect to see developing over the next couple of years here? Yeah, so um, we are, we've recently completed um, with, with our other partners a uh, plan for Old Olive. Okay. And we want to create, Old Olive is an important link to this because it, 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 there's a residential element, there is a, a, uh, a retail and restaurant um, arm to, to this area that, that is really important. Sure. So there is a, a streetscaping, basically a great, great streets project hmm. that uh, is, is, is really what Old Olive is all about. And so the first phase of that is reactivating the Old Olive and Lindbergh intersection. Okay. Right now it's cut off by a median and there is no way for a for a pedestrian to cross it safely. Yeah. Um, but with uh, with with our plan, we're going to reactivate that, create a, a full intersection, and really reconnect both okay. east and west uh, of Lindbergh. So we think that's a real key element of of, of that. So we've got some um, projects going to to get that first phase. The other thing that we're working on. Um, there was another project initiated by St. Louis County and the partnership is the intersection of Lindbergh and Olive. And um, basically making that pedestrian, um, uh, pedestrian friendly by yeah. having sidewalks on there and also by creating some new developable lots on there that aren't available now because these clover relief interchanges which are, which are so prevalent, yeah. they take up so much land. Right. And, and they really are devouring land that is, um, which really are excellent opportunities for redevelopment. Mm -hmm. So we can not only create some new private development opportunities with the Olive and Lindbergh interchange project, but also make it a little bit more pedestrian friendly as well. Well, it seems like, yeah, that keeps coming up, and it's especially here, but also in all these innovation districts, the idea of being kind of walkable mm -hmm. and welcome for people to so get around on foot, right? Yep. So yeah. why, why is that particularly so important for developing this kind of innovation district, do you think? You know, it's, I think it's what, what people want. You know, yeah. it's, it's what, you know, workers and, and, and people, uh, millennials, and, you know, up to my age, you know, I think there's a real desire to have a place that's that's not only oriented by the automobile. And, and hey, let's sure. face it, you know, Creve Corps is a suburban community. Sure. We are largely driven by, you know, I mean, by the automobile. But there there is a way to create to create a little bit places that to, that, that that offer more than that and offer some pedestrian connections not only for walkers but for bikers sure. and that's that's a key component of this and along those lines the um, Great Rivers Greenway is also creating a plan in this area yeah and uh, and we've been the city's been actively involved in, in that and, and uh, you know so it is important not only for 39 North but really for Creve Corps to become more pedestrian oriented and to do what we can um, we've been really working on, on sidewalk improvement projects in Creek Corps since I've, since I've uh, been with the city, and that's been a real emphasis for, for our city council uh, over the years. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's what, that's what people want to see. You know, they, they want to see, a, they wanna see what, a place that's developed. Sure. Um, and they want to be able to walk to it, and not only just walk to, be able to walk perhaps you know, to work, maybe They'd be able to walk or get on a bike and, and go to lunch. Um, get to know, where they so need to get easier, yeah, right? So I'm, in the car. Yeah, when I moved, I used to live in Clayton when I moved downtown. That's one of the primary things. I'm like, I need to have park. I need to have work. Mm -hmm. I need to have fun all in that same. And it needs to be walkable. So I think mm -hmm. that sort of validates yeah, that. So you're on the right track. It sounds like <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very and cool. Clayton's a great place to do it. You know? yeah. Cool. Well, it sounds like it's all going really well. I mean, is there yeah. anything in the next five to ten years we should be particularly keeping our eyes on development-wise? You know, I was, uh, certainly, and, and, and our focus is, is certainly on, on five or ten years, but it's also on the next, you know, three to five years. Sure. Which we want to make some of these infrastructure improvements happen that I was talking about that will really help set the, set the groundwork for, um, for the ag tech industry. Yeah. to really develop in, in, in an area where we've got a lot of good infrastructure already. 
we've got assets, we've got location. Um, but yeah, we're excited about doing what we can do for the city to help of course, help make it happen. Keep it moving. All right. Well, congratulations so far. Cheers, Mark. Yeah, Here's. thanks. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Cheers, Eric. Of course, as always, you yeah, know. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for joining us Thank today. you. Appreciate you stopping Thanks by. for letting me uh, chat with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and for those of you watching, you know, we are going to be you. here for a few more, uh, about half an hour or so more here at The Art of Alcohol. So please continue to tune in. Thanks so much for listening to this conversation. And we will see you again very soon. All right, well, we are back here at the Art of Alcohol with Venture Cafe. This is the Bourbon Friday Show. I'm Nick Niehaus, and I'm talking to Lynn from Edelbron. And we're going to try a fruit brandy, right? That's right, yeah. All right, so tell me about this fruit brandy. Well, Edelbron Pure Distilling is my company. Okay. Uh, my husband is Swiss, oh, okay. and so he's the distiller of these spirits. Very cool. Um, I was just in Switzerland like three months ago. All right. That's awesome. Well, yeah. then you hopefully you tried something like this. Uh, well, we'll find out. I got, I got to taste it first. Yeah. So a European style fruit brandy is one that is 100% fruit. Okay. Uh, it doesn't have anything in it but yeast and water. So there, everything you're going to taste is from the fruit itself. Okay. The aromatics, mm -hmm. the flavor. And we don't add any chemicals. There's no flavor. There's no extra additions of any chemicals, any essences. Um, and so, what you're tasting is only what the fruit can give. Really? Okay. Uh, the other mark of a fruit brandy is that it's unaged, and so okay. you don't have any influence of the barrel, whether it's from the oak or the char inside the barrel. So all you're tasting is what the fruit can give you. And then the third thing is it's dry. So these have sweet notes. But what you're going to taste is, again, just what the fruit can give, and we'll see what you think of it. Very cool. That sounds very unique, so I'm excited to try it. I've got six products. Okay. We're going to try the grappa. Grappa, This okay. is our version of a grappa, so this is 100% fruit. Um, this is a Chardonnay grape, and if I were pouring in your home tonight, I'd be pouring to the widest part of the bowl. Okay. That would be about a one ounce pour. Gotcha. And we would spend 15 to 20 minutes sa savoring that. Savoring that, okay. Well, so tell me about these glasses, too, because these are these are really beautiful and interesting. Is these, that, what, what's the purpose of the, the shape of this glass? Sure. Here? This is a European-style nosing glass. Okay. So these are actually grappa glasses that we import from Italy. Okay. And we would pour to the widest part of the bowl. They're made so you can cradle them. Mm -hmm. The warmer right. the spirit gets, the more aromatic it becomes. All right. And if you've never tasted a fruit brandy, the first thing you want to do is get it under your nose. And so you just want to smell it and see if you can pick up on that Chardonnay grape. Okay. Now we do our grappa a little bit differently. We have an infusion of dill in there. Oh yeah. So yeah, you yeah. might be able yeah, to there was smell something the else. Yeah, there was something else there. Yeah. But I was like, okay, that doesn't exactly smell like I would have was expecting it. So it's, yes. it's the dill. It is the dill. And it's very common for Swiss distillers to play with botanicals. Okay. And so my husband likes dill. That's why it's in there. When you go to taste your first sip, mm -hmm. you want to ba basically make it a small sip, let it spread across your mid palate, okay. and then give it a little bit of air. Again, you don't have the influence of the barrel, so you need it to open up just a little bit. So go ahead and gotcha. take your first right, sip and see what you think. These are proofed between 80 and 84. If we were proofing this for a European crowd, we would be proofing this at 86. They like that heat. Okay. But we take it down a little bit for the American palate. Wow. And uh, what you're tasting here is 100% Chardonnay. We also make one with 100% Norton, 100% Noiré, and also a blend. Now, what you're tasting here also just got back from an international competition. Oh, really? It brought back 93 points, and it was a finalist. Wow. So, Congratulations. Thank you very awesome. much. The distiller was smiling for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, yeah. He really well, enjoyed so, it. So tell me a little bit about your brand and your company, because I, I, you told me before the show that you don't make many of these bottles over here, so it's we pretty don't. exclusive stuff. Yeah. So we make about 1,200 bottles a year. Once they're sold, they're gone. Okay, wow, um, that's, that's we, very few, I mean, overall. like that's The process is pretty hand, uh, hand involved. So we okay. start with the fruit. Every piece of fruit gets touched at least three times. Uh, the first year we produced our spirits, we used about 500 pounds of apples. Okay. Uh, to this year, we will produce about 11,400 pounds of fruit mash. Gotcha. So it takes a lot of fruit to make one of these bottles. It's about eight to nine pounds of grapes in this bottle wow, right okay. here. These are Missouri grapes. 
uh, wherever we can get our grapes locally or our fruit locally, we do that. Um, so we get our grapes and our apples inside Missouri. The rest of the fruits come off of the West Coast. So we prep the mash by uh, cleaning it, removing the stems. This grappa is the only thing we keep the stem in because okay. traditional grappa is made with the whole stem. Okay. And then we uh, mash it down. We add our yeast and our fruit, okay. our, our yeast and our water. And then we end up with this really clunky mat, you know, mash Sounds mixture. Like it, yeah. huh. And then it's all up to the fermentation. So our fermentation times vary. For this, it's four to six weeks. Okay. For our apple, it's up to 10 to 12 months. Really? How, well, why, why so much of a difference? There? Well, that's where you get that nose and that flavor that you're experiencing. Okay. And uh, so the longer the mash tanks, if you can be that patient, you will end up with a really good mash yeah, and awesome. a great never, I've spirit. I've definitely never tasted anything like this. this I'm glad you nice. like yeah. it. Glad you like it. And so traditionally, these are served after dinner as an after dinner drink or a digestif. Okay. If you want to mix it up, and a lot of cocktail um, mixologists uh, really play with these, uh, they'll add gins and vermouths and play and just really create some beautiful cocktails. But a simple way to enjoy these is to do a four ounce pour of prosecco, and okay. then dash one to two teaspoons of any of these on top, and they're delightful. Yeah, a nice way nice. to serve it after dinner or before dinner. So if I'm honest, this is the first time I've heard of fruit brandy, right? Yeah. So I mean, is this something that, are, are you one of the only brands in, in the U.S. making this or is it catching We're on certainly or? one of the few in the Midwest. Okay. Most of these, if you saw these, if you were to find a lot of these, they would be on either the Northeast Corridor or on the West Coast where you've got the big orchards. Gotcha. So Clear Creek Distillery is a beautiful um, uh, producer of these fruit brandies. I think they have over 30. Uh, but they are dealing in much larger quantities. So their mash tanks are thousands of pounds of mash. Gotcha. Ours are 14. So we can afford to leave these in mash tanks for a long time. They have about a 10 day fermentation period to two weeks. Okay. Ours can go up to 10 to 12 months. Wow. And so we really depend on babying those mashes. When we get ready to distill, we do a double distillation. So, um, and it's literally coming off of a 12 or an 18 gallon copper pot still a little more than a drop at a time wow. over about six and a half hours. Sounds wow. like a very painstaking process. <laughs> it is. It's but it's, we love making them and we love introducing people to them. These are meant to really after dinner to just linger over. Yeah. And so when you've got a good meal behind you and you just want to sit at the table, you pull just these out and you're just uh, yeah. sipping something to really enjoy and extend the evening. Yeah, that's awesome. So, like I can envision it right now yeah. after Thanksgiving dinner and you know, uh, down to enjoy it. It's wonderful. Um, so we have six products. This is one of them. We also have apple infused with plum. Okay. We also have a pear, a cherry, a plum, and a an apricot. Okay. And uh, so I'm glad you tried them. No, it's delicious. Oh, no. And I have to ask now, if somebody wants to get their own bottle, where yes. can they do that? They can either order direct from us okay. or we are in about 15 locations here in St. Louis. If you go to our website, Edelbron Pure Distilling, you'll be able to find us. And then we are also out in Kansas City. We oh, actually have a large right. presence out in Kansas City. Very Same cool. thing, it's on our website. All right, yeah. well, I like it. Well, obviously go out and check it out, and I want to thank you, Lynn, so much thank for joining us much. tonight. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Yeah, and Eric, much, as always, Eric. thanks for being here. Yeah. And uh, I think we are getting close to wrapping up, but I think I heard we might have one more guest for you. So if you are tuning in, please join us in a few more minutes, and thanks for watching us. We'll see you soon. We are back at the Artie Alcohol here with Venture Cafe. This is the Bourbon Friday Show. I'm Nick Niehaus. I'm talking to Marco from Tres R. Did I get it close? Uh, yes. So, okay, I was close yes. enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy about that. So correct. This is your tequila. Tell us a bit about it. Yes. Well, uh, like you said, uh, the name is Tres R. Okay. And the, re the reason that it's called Tres R is because uh, I made this tequila. Let's say in honor of my late grandfather, his okay. name was Rafael Roman Rodarte. Okay. So he was a cattle rancher, and uh, all the cattle he branded it with the three and the R. Right? Oh, cool. So uh, I just decided to use this, that name, mm -hmm. and then there was a, we like to say it was kind of a family legend, where they would say that back in 1949, my grandfather stole my grandmother by force. So that's why we put the... <laughs> That's why you see oh, the illustration the, in yeah, the cool. bottle, just All because right. of that. Kind of a, put that 
front and center for everybody and thankfully that's kind of a draws people in uh, like the, they like the bottle and then like they see the illustration yeah, the story, like yeah. what it is and so so we have all those elements that has helped us kind of uh, become one of the tequilas that people pay attention to uh, at the shelf because that's the real battle being it's at real, the shelf yeah. and then hey look at that bottle I like it oh mm -hmm. look at the illustration oh that's cool oh look at the story nice combination so that's been a really good help for us yeah so have you found a lot of people have kind of just found it on the shelf is that part of how you're discovered or? uh yes and no i mean it's a lot of the time it's doing tasting of course and, yeah, you gotta get uh, out and let people try at it, the right? stores yeah. and uh and i think it's really important for us to just tell the story and then then sure. what they find out that i'm actually the grandson and uh, this kind of family thing they actually like okay. that part yeah. and of course having the tequila tastes really good helps yeah, a lot that's right? why that's the gets the repeat so, business right if i didn't have that then i would be doing something else of course Completely. yeah yeah well so let's talk uh, well maybe we should pour some first so yes, we can try it you definitely. know because we want to obviously give I mean, it a little try here but a as you're pouring it why don't you tell us a little bit about what is in the bottle here sure thing i mean this is what is considered a lowland tequila okay uh if you're familiar with tequilas you only get two types, Highland and Lowland. Okay. Okay. And uh, the difference is just how high hasn't been like growing the agave. Okay. So we're talking altitude. Altitude, right? okay. correct. Yep. Like Highland is anything above six thousand feet of elevation. Oh wow, that's pretty high. I mean, that's yeah, pretty and uh, so basically and in the mountains is what that would be, or correct. Okay. And the main difference is because of uh, the agave gets more rain. Yeah. So the plants grow a little bit bigger. Okay. So okay. it gets more sugar content. So that's why okay. Highland tequilas are, are going to be a little bit more sweet compared to a Lowland tequila. Okay. And if you smell it and taste uh -huh. this one, it's going to give you a little bit of uh, earthy notes. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you're going to smell also. Lowlands are known for having a strong agave aroma. Yeah. Once gotcha. you, yeah. Well, you tried it first. What do you think? I really like this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not much of a tequila drinker. Let's say you're a bourbon guy. So I am. I'm not know. much of a tequila drinker, but what but strikes you about a it? lot of it's just like super clean. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah. That is. And, and and well, and like a lot of people that have seen me after Bourbon Friday or wherever, I don't drink a lot of bourbon outside of the show because okay. we're having that event and we're drinking bourbon. Yeah, the you drink plenty time of bourbon for, already, by the way. You know, two hours or you know of drinking bourbon so I often you know whether it's gin or something else I'm always looking for something else to try and then also you know I got into bourbon a lot because there's so much to learn because it's such a historic thing in this country that I do still like to learn about other spirits whether it's gin or tequila or that kind of thing so. yeah and definitely I mean one of the things that also helps is just following a traditional process of sure. course we don't uh, use what is called a taona which is you know like if you've seen like the big stone wheel with the donkey pulling it to okay. smash the agave yeah uh, we don't do that we actually uh use um, a, a shredder machine okay. okay and that's mainly just to uh, get uh, the, all of the juice from as much as possible okay. to, because you don't maximize the output from when you're using a taona though there's a special place for a taona because you get actually a dis distinctive taste when it comes to sure. doing so the that. The process so affects the exactly, flavor, right? Yes. Yeah. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the big, uh, big deal breaker for me when it comes to tequila is when somebody uses decides to use uh, what is called an autoclave, okay. which is kind of a pressure cooker mm -hmm. compared oh, okay. to a traditional yeah, yeah. oven. So the only difference is, is uh, speed, but then you can actually taste the difference at yeah. the end. So. Uh, to me, is that's really important and always sticking to like that specific cooking. I mean, I don't mind so much that uh, we use a, uh, let's call it industrial shredder just to destroy the agave because the important part of it was just like cooking it right and then get all the juices out so that you actually ferment it naturally. And that's another big step because the fermentation is also slow, it takes uh, up to 96 hours, oh, okay. which helps a lot and then that's what you get at the end. I mean, a, a smooth tequila uh, that a lot of people just, the fact that I have yeah. experiences with people that don't usually drink right, tequila, yeah, yeah. Yeah, clean. drink this and they 
Nice. And that even go to the store to buy something else, but they end up living with this bottle instead right. of what they were actually trying to buy. Wow, okay. Well, so what what is the goal when you're making a really high-end or good tequila? Are you looking for like smoothness or a flavor? Or kind of what, what are you aiming for with your process there? When it comes to tequila, it's all about just give people the full expression of what tequila really is. Okay. Because let's be honest, I mean, there's a lot of tequilas in the market. Yeah. I mean, uh, some of them are good. Don't get me wrong. I have my own favorites that I actually drink. <laughs> sure. Because I'm not going to sit here and tell you this is the best in the world because yeah. that doesn't exist. Yeah. It's just it's all preference, like, right? Yeah. It, yes. It's all preference. It's yep. subjective. It's, yeah. it's all about the taste that you have. I mean, uh -huh. hey, I've had people that tell me, oh, I love Jose Cuervo. Like, okay, man. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. I mean, given the fact that I, even Jose Cuervo has good tequilas, but... He was talking about Jose Cuervo Especial, but I'm like, okay. Either you lost all sense of taste. Yeah, now, this is that, not uh, that in any. But uh, but yeah. it happened, right? It was like you just have to say it like, if, and even when um, when I run in people that oh, I, I love Patron. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And uh, and you get a lot of uh, people in the tequila industry that actually criticizes those people like, oh, you don't know tequila because you're drinking Patrona. Hey. How can you know if that's the only thing that they've ever tasted? So, of course, they're going to like it. Yeah, sure. But if you give them something like this, that oh, you know what? I didn't know that there were more options or like something more yeah. Uh, yeah. smoother than Patron. Right. And something I often talk about in bourbon is a lot of people will ask me, well, what's your favorite? And I'm like, uh, my response is, well, for what? Yes. What, uh, it, what is yeah. my favorite sitting in a dive bar? What is my favorite, you know, hanging out, having a special thing by a campfire? You know, what is right. my favorite? bourbon for what thing correct is yes. very important yes definitely. well so that leads to kind of my last question for you is like what what kind of mixed drink would you would you suggest for this you know what uh one drink that i like to do a lot is uh use that just experimented by myself uh oh, okay. i sometimes just throw a little bit of a uh, agave nectar sure into this okay and then uh, i found uh some bitters like from scrappy bitters that I've tried, uh, okay. like the lime ones, okay. or the chocolate one actually oh, goes really, really okay. well. And just drinking it like that is uh, really cool. But of course, uh, one of my favorites is like, especially in the summer, it's called the Matador. Okay. It just has like tequila, just orange juice, and uh, basic stuff. It's simple to make. Yeah. And of course, the, the skinny margarita with this and agave nectar is just perfect. All right, well, I'm going to write all those down after we're done talking because this all sound amazing. This is delicious. Yes. Right, thanks like so it. much Cheers. for joining us. Cheers. Eric, you know, thanks for being here all night. I appreciate you riding along as we go. And for those of you tuning in, I think we have one more conversation coming to you. We're so extending things a little bit. Uh, please join us again here at The Art of Alcohol. We'll be back in just a couple seconds. Thanks. All right, well, we are wrapping things up here at the Art of Alcohol with Venture Cafe. I am your host, Nick Niehaus. This is a version, at least, of Bourbon Friday. I'm talking to Massimo from KWS, and we're going to talk about some science at the end of a night of drinking. Right so I'm hoping I can understand it. So, Massimo, you guys do uh, some pretty interesting gene editing, right? Yeah, we're really at the tip of the spear here. Okay. We're a big company, an old company called KWS. We're right. a seed company. Ultimately, our product is bags of seed for farmers. But behind that bag of seed is a lot of like very cool stuff that happens. Breeding, oh, biotech, gene editing, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And we're that's what we deal with here in St. Louis. Well, that's, well, that's, all, that's a lot to unpack. Is there some fascinating stuff? Talk to me about like kind of where does this process start, right? So you're, you're trying to trying to edit a plant. You're trying to edit the, the genome, you know, the DNA. Yeah. Uh, do you start with like a, a target? Are you trying to accomplish something? Or do you experiment? How does, how does that mean, process you work? You put it so beautifully based on a lot of experiments, physiological uh -huh. experiments, we come up with targets, okay. you know, the right targets, or our customers actually come up with targets. If you manipulate this gene, you get a plant that sips instead of gulps water. You know, oh, okay. you get a plant that can grow yeah. in sand instead of soil. Oh, you wow. really like open up the world to amazing biotech, sure. amazing agriculture and stuff like that. And we, here in St. Louis, provide the technology that drives that and that makes it happen. Interesting, okay. Amazing. So when you, when you say you provide the technology that drives that, tell me a little bit more about that. What does that look like? What kind of well, tech are you providing? Yeah. It's called gene editing here in St. Louis. That's what we focus on in corn. So okay. to that end, there's a molecular division. We ma They make the uh, gene editing components that like make these cuts, these edits in the genome. 
And then my component, where I work personally, is the cell biology component. So we okay. get that into the plant cell, and we make plants regenerate from these cells, these single cells, uh -huh. with these qualities in them that make farmers happy, basically. Sure. You know, we make plants that grow with less water, that can make more seed, more mm -hmm. bang for their buck. It's amazing. Yeah, that is And so a basically, we're taking breeding, you know, that's always happened for thousands or hundreds of thousands sure. of years, and we accelerate that. Mm. And uh, we make it worth it, worth their while, you know, this bag of seed that they buy, that they grow, to, uh, to buy that seed. Yeah. Well, it's amazing to think that, like, you know, you have what you've experienced as a, as a farmer for many years, and you say, mm. oh, I want to I wanna accomplish something that, that advances the plants mm. I'm growing, and then you just buy a new bag of seed and it happens, right? right? So I think I want to ask you about this. It's a little bit controversial for certain people, right? So yeah. we talk about like GMO and it's mm -hmm. such a scary thing. Yeah. Um, but on the other side, from the scientific standpoint, a lot of times you're just accelerating a process farmers were already doing, right? I yeah. mean, they're taking certain plants and they're trying to breed them together in a way that was producing certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. So tell me, tell me a little bit about like how much has this accelerated that process? So, you know, maybe 50, 100 years ago, the farmers were trying to do this. So how, how much quicker can you accomplish now. Well, it's accelerated it tremendously. Yeah, I so bet, yeah. in breeding, what it used to take a generation to do, we can do in a year now. So that's really? incredible. Wow. Okay. On the other hand, I recognize the fact, and I don't want to downplay this, because sure. this whole debate about GMs and things like that yep. is rooted in a real fundamental thing mm -hmm. about what we feed our kids, what we ingest ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we don't want bad stuff. And so the reality is that the industrial food system, what we eat, like high fructose corn syrup and things like that, are bad for us. And GMs and GE crops kind of contribute to that, sure. right? Okay. So at the end of the day, we want to make things that are better for farmers and make food cheaper for all of us to eat. Well, of course, At yeah. the same time, we each individually want to be healthy. Yeah. You work out probably, I work out. We want to eat the right things. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we're ingesting the right things. Sure. We want to make sure our kids eat of things course, that yeah. are the best for their futures mm -hmm. as well. And it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm seeing, you know, particularly this day and age, you know, I with know. Donald it's Trump in the presidency, yep. it's very polarized. Yeah. You're either on this side and you, you know, you hate everything that side does or you're on that side, yep. you hate everything this side. Does. It's terrible. Right. And we should get to this point where we kind of acknowledge the complexity of the situation right. as scientists well, yeah because i mean it's interesting to talk about you know from one side oh you know gmo anti-gmo mm -hmm. whatever but then yeah. those same people are often like environmentalists right and they want to like reduce how much water we use right and you're yeah. talking about accomplishing that with the, the plants right mm -hmm. so i mean obviously there's a lot of like improvements so tell, tell us about some of the improvements you've been able to make by being able to do some of this gene editing Gene editing is the most amazing thing. It takes everything we can do uh, that we did previously with gen uh, GM or genetically modified crops uh -huh. and accelerates it, right? Okay. So we can take things that are very important to farmers, mm -hmm. like making more bang for your buck. Of course, yeah. You, you plant one seed, you get more uh, yield from that, uh -huh. one way or another, whether it's right. um, you know making plants grow with less inputs or making plants grow with the same inputs but more outputs. At the end of the day, you know, farmers are smart people. Of course, they're yeah. not going to invest in something that doesn't provide more bang for their buck. So that's essentially our business model, uh -huh. right? And so basically what they provide makes the world a better place in the sense that we make cheaper food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, when deal. you think about the fact that in the, in the society we live, you can actually get you know, obesity is a problem for poor people these days. Yeah. yeah now, this does not mean that like we're where we need to be at this moment, right? Yeah. But the fact that for however millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years of Ooh. civilization, starvation has been a problem, and now the poorest people suffer from obesity, right. means we've gotten to a step change that like we're addressing a completely different problem. <laughs> sure. And we need to address this problem, but the fact is, we've gotten to a point where a very small percentage of the population can provide all the food that we all That's need. True, we yeah, can just go to Snucks or Deerberg's mm -hmm. here in St. Louis yeah. and get everything we need for a very small fraction of our salary. Because it used to require you know, a lot more yeah. labor let's to not make forget. all this food. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. let's and not I, forget. And we, I think uh, I have a guy that I went to in school, he's a biochemist and mm -hmm. he talks about this a lot. I see a lot of his posts on Facebook and he's and he talks about this and we're just like, yeah. oh, we're only changing 
one gene versus when we were crossbreeding plants, we're changing exactly. who knows how yeah, many it's genes. more predictable. Yeah. But I, want, I really want to be clear about this because I don't think that talks about enough. Yeah. In my community, the scientists, it's kind of the opposite of what we see in like the other community on Facebook and things like that, or this is what I see, where yeah, it's yeah. like these idiots, they don't know what they're talking about, you know, these assholes, they're like working for corporate sure. science. I think there's sure. a middle ground where we yeah. are all, we want the best for our kids. Yeah. We want to make sure what we ingest in our own bodies, what we put in our kids' bodies, are the best that we have to offer. And I don't think that gets communicated enough, especially in this day and age. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I really wish we could all turn down the volume a little bit and yeah. just talk about it. Talk about the science. Right, yeah. Talk about you know what what's really good for us. You know what corresponds with our you know decisions about health and things like that. Of course, yeah. And understand that yeah, there's a food system in place that's not very healthy, mm-hmm. and you know what we sell to farmers is good for them. It's sure. good for us, but. We need to keep that into consideration too. Well, and it's also right? about like what happens after the farmers grow the food, right? Because exactly. a lot of what's making us unhealthy is how we then turn that food into things that are super concentrated and not necessarily good My for Lord, our bodies. That's so right? important. Yeah. My philosophy on that: a Twinkie is shit, no matter <laughs> yeah, whether right. it's organic. Yeah. yeah. It can be organic <laughs> Twinkie, still bad you for know, you, right? The food scientists have it worked out. Whether you put X amount of organic sugar into it or X amount of genetically modified high fructose corn syrup to it's shit, right? But we all know, we intrinsically know yeah. this, that it's shit. And we also know you need to have a little bit more protein than carbs and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But like, that's not necessarily compatible with the food system. So right. even though we, even though I make a product that ultimately ends up in a bag of seed, and that bag of seed ends up in, industri- in the industrial sure. food system, yeah. what we see when we fly over the US from New York to LA and we see like, for two hours of that flight, this sure. system, mm-hmm. um, it's not good for our health. It's not good for our pot bellies necessarily. Mm-hmm. But number one, it's important that we have solved the problem of starvation. And oh, number yeah. two, we're at the next level that we need to figure out how to yeah. like take all these excess calories and channel them the right way. Of Is course, that so yeah. bad? No, I think that's a great so, point. That's like you know evolution of a species is about addressing one problem at a time right so we yeah. are we are addressing you know hey you know wow now we all at least in this country have access to a ton yeah. of food that's a great yeah. you know we're exporting right. a ton of food right like exactly. we're feeding the rest and of the world and we just haven't adapted fast yeah. enough yeah. because so of you know we, this this thing yeah. Yeah. you know exactly. we haven't adapted thing, fast right? enough to having <laughs> yeah. Well, he's got less of one than we do. Well, you know, I'm working on it, but you know, it's it's a struggle, brothers. It's a struggle. But yeah, the bottom line is like, we need to have the respect because I see this in, you know, the vaccine debate too. That's a lot more polarized and it's a lot more obvious, but at the same time, I feel like there's something happening with all of us these days, this day and age, where we are forced to pick sides almost like it's a sports oh, no, team. It's terrible, yeah. And it's like, if I'm on this team, I have to hate this team. Yep. And I, I have to reject all your arguments and I can't listen to you. Mm-hmm. And I really want to like drive a, a, a movement where we just eliminate that, eradicate yeah. that and just understand the science. Because at the end of the day, you know, as a scientist, I have to face the, the facts and the facts are based on data. Course, and if the yeah. data doesn't support my pet theory, every day at work, you know, I, I really want this to happen right. because it's good for my career. Right, it's good, yeah. you know, it's very cool, whatever. If it doesn't support it, I have to like swallow it and say, yeah. okay, friends, yeah. this is fine. <laughs> we move on to the next thing. As a scientist, How can we you get have to, to be that? willing to be right. wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think? How can that. we get to that? It's like, you know, when we debate this in right. the in the media. I mean, even, like my Oof. background is in science. Like you have to test the fact that you're wrong. Yeah. Like you're going for wrong yeah. to prove yeah. that you're right. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, well, that's a good point. If we could all try to prove ourselves wrong first, yeah. right? Seek to understand the other side, like we'd really improve as a society. I think so. I think so. Well, that's great. That's a that's a great message to end the night on, yeah. right there. Right? It's like try to understand each other first, yeah. before you try to prove your own point, right? Indeed. Be a scientist about your conversation. Sure. Let's understand yeah. each other. All right. Well, have some good thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure Cheers. to be here. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Those of you tuning in, it has been a long night. We've had a lot of fun here. We want to thank you for watching. This has been the Art of Alcohol at Venture Cafe. This is the Bourbon Friday Show. (laughs) Thank you so much for watching. We will be back this Friday, so please join us this Friday for the regular Bourbon Friday Show, and we can't wait to see you then. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, thanks for watching. We truly hope you enjoyed it. Please like and share this episode, and if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out. To stay up to date, 
Follow us on social. We are at Bourbon Fridays on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. See you next time.